Good morning. I got to tell you what I absolutely love is to see God's grace at work and God changing hearts and changing lives, and, and it's, it, that's, that's what gets me up in the morning, and it's exciting. And so that's happening in a variety of settings, and that certainly is one of them at Celebrate Recovery. Now, what we're talking about today in Acts chapter 10 is going to be God's grace at work as well. And what we're going to see is that God was at work 2,000 years ago in his church. God wants to be at work today in our church and in us and through us. And so we're going to lay out what that looks like. And what I'd like to do today is basically start with some questions, because I hear questions all the time. And by the way, it's okay to ask questions. I remember growing up and going to a church in my early 20s, and I was told not to ask questions. And I said, you, and the, the pastor said, you think too much. You're asking too many questions. And, uh, and I remember thinking, well, maybe I, I don't belong, you know. But he, here's what I want to tell you. God says, ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. There are questions you and I need to ask because a part of our growth is contingent on us engaging in asking questions. Today, there are three questions that I hear quite often that are answered in today's passage. And so I want to lay out those three questions for you. Uh, and maybe you've asked these. And as a matter of fact, if you've asked these questions, it's kind of raise your hand, uh, whether you're here or at home, and just say, you're, you know, I've, I've asked that. What, what of those who have never heard the gospel? Have you ever asked that question besides me? Okay, what, what happens to those who don't hear? You know, what, what, what happens there? Well, that, that question is addressed as we get into Acts chapter 10. Or here's another one. If you've ever read through the book of Leviticus, you know, the question is, is God a legalist? Is he expecting us to be a legalist? I don't know if you've ever asked that question, but I certainly have. You know, and, and that question is going to be addressed today as well. Or how about the whole issue of God's chosen? And it seems like God might have favorites. Does God have favorites? And, 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 and that's a good question to ask. Does God favor some people over others? And so we're going to get into today's passage to really answer all three of those questions. And so if you've ever asked those, we're bringing those questions to Scripture today, Acts chapter 10. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through 23 verses as we basically look at three answers to those questions. And so the first question, you know, what of those who have never heard? The, the point number one in your outline is this, God will reward those who earnestly seek him. And we're going to meet a guy named Cornelius here in Acts chapter 10, who is earnestly seeking God. And he's never heard of Jesus, and he's, he's outside the loop, but yet he is seeking and earnestly desirous to connect to the one true God. And because of that, God moves in Cornelius' life. And so we're going to get into that. So Acts chapter 10, follow along. I'm going to read some of these verses to you. And as we go through them, just kind of explain some of them as we go. So beginning in Acts 10 verse 1, it says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what is known as the Italian Regiment. He and all of his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed regularly. Now this tells us a whole lot about this guy named Cornelius. And so first of all, let, let me just kind of describe what's going on in these verses to you. He says, at Caesarea. Now I've been there. Caesarea is along the coast north of Tel Aviv. And, and it's, a, it's a beautiful city. You still can go today to Caesarea in Israel, and you can see the ruins of the Colosseum that was there right, right by the ocean. And you can walk into this port city that all the roads in town led to the port city. It was actually built as a Roman city, and so because of that, it was much more Roman than Jewish. And, and, and you had some Jewish people that lived there, like Pontius Pilate, but in, in fact, the city was, was much more Roman. Uh, and understand that. It, it, the culture was much more like Rome than, than like Jerusalem. And, uh, and this guy is a centurion. Now, most centurions were battle-hard, rugged kind of people who were a bit cynical, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit perhaps even sadistic, because the Roman army was cynical and sadistic. And to be in the Roman army, it, it, was, it was awful. They, they would have things like decimation sometimes. And you've heard of the Roman army do this, where they lined everybody up. Decimation comes from they line 10 soldiers up, and they kill one out of, out of every 10, just to show them that they're in charge. 
And this, this is the Roman army. And so this guy is a centurion. He is a leader in the Roman army. But not only that, he is in the Italian regiment. Notice this. That means he is a Roman through and through. He's Italian. He's European. And the Italian regiment, by the way, were the elite regiment. They, they were the most honored and, and, the most, uh, uh, and the most notable of all of the Italians. They would go into this regiment. It, it wasn't conquered people that were in this regiment. It was only Italians. Uh, he was probably Roman himself from the city of Rome, as most of these were. But notice what else it says about him. It says that he's devout. Devout means he believed in the one true God. You see, if you're a Roman, you've got gods for everything. You've got a God for war. You've got a God for harvest. You've got a God for death. You've got a God for the sun. You've got a God for... that Caesar's called a God. I mean, you've got a God for everything if you're Roman, but, but he believed in the one true God. In other words, he had rejected all of the Roman gods, small g, in favor of the one true God, capital G. And he had, he, he had become devout to the one true God, but he's also described as God-fearing. Now, you need to understand what God-fearing means. These, this, this word or this phrase describes Gentiles, non-Jewish people, who actually believed in the one true God but weren't circumcised, did not follow the, the, the Jewish calendar and rituals and dietary codes and Sabbath or any of those things. They just, just believed in the one true God. They were called God-fears. He was not a Jewish convert. He had not become Judea. He had not become Jewish. He had not embraced Judaism. He was a God fearer. But then also, notice how else he's described. Uh, verses one through two are loaded, talking about this guy. He is generous and prayed regularly. So he gives to the poor. He's kind hearted. Can, can people who don't know Jesus be good people? Absolutely. Generous and kind. Sometimes, sometimes I find kinder people outside the church than I do in the church. Have you ever done that? Uh, I mean, uh, he's he's kind. He's generous. He's loving. He's noble. He cares about the poor. He he genuinely cares about the poor. He's genuinely seeking God because he's also prayerful. And so you see all of this going on in Cornelius, but what we understand is that he does all these things, he is all these things, but he's not yet right with God, he needs Jesus. And and, and that's the point of the story, he's not yet right with God. And so what we're going to see in this passage, we're going to see a a person who's not yet right with God, who's actually quite noble and good, and then we're going to cut to Peter, who is right with God, and he's stuck in prejudice and legalism. And you got a problem. And sometimes this describes the church. And, and God is saying that there's two conversions that take place in the passage we're going to read. You've got the conversion of Cornelius, and then you've got the conversion of Peter out of legalism and prejudice. And both of those need to happen for the church to move where it moves. And so that, that's what's going on. This guy is, is a good man, genuinely good, but he still needs Jesus. Now go with me to verse 3. It says this, On one day, at about three in the afternoon, Cornelius had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Now, Cornelius stared at him in fear. Now, notice that Cornelius' response is fear. Now, I'm pointing that out because later on, Peter gets a vision, and his response is he yawns and says, yeah, I don't know. And there's a big problem between the two. (laughs) But Cornelius responds, he doesn't know God, but he responds in fear to God. And this isn't trembling, this is a reverential fear that Cornelius has when God sends this message to him. Here he is. And notice what God says through the angel. Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Do you know what God is saying here? And this might shake some of us if we're legalistic. God is saying he receives the worship of people who don't know him. He hears the prayers of people who don't know him. He is saying that this guy didn't quite know God, and he's, he's devout, and he's giving, and he's, and he's compassionate for the poor. And God is saying, I am receiving what you have done as worship for me. Now I want to introduce myself. And that's what's happening here. Well, we ask the question, what of those who have never heard? And here you've got this guy, Cornelius, who has never heard, but yet we're going to see that God is drawing him 
to himself. God is pulling him to himself. Now, another thing I want to point out is that the angel of God says to him these words. He says, he says your prayers of, uh, of gifts of, uh, to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa, bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. And he says, let me connect you to Peter. Now I want to make a really clear point here. The angel is not preaching the gospel to Cornelius. He could, but he doesn't. He doesn't say, Cornelius, the God that you have been seeking is Jesus. He died for your sins. Put your faith in him. He doesn't preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel is for the church, not for the angels. And he sends, he, and, and so what he does is he connects Cornelius to Peter. And why is preaching the gospel for the church and not the angels? Because there is a counterfeit. And there are angels who are not of God. They're called demons. And there are two main religions on the face of this planet who have started when angels have told the founder of this religion, here, write down these words. I'm giving you another gospel. And you've got a problem. Paul said these words. He said this himself in Galatians 1.8. He says, even if an angel of God preaches a gospel other than what has been given to you through the apostles... Let them be cursed. Uh, and, so, uh, and so it's important that the angel does not preach. The angel connects Cornelius to someone who can. And what does this mean? This means that we as a church, and the church is made up of everyone who has put their faith in Jesus, it's up to us now to share the gospel with those that God is drawing to himself. People like Cornelius, who are far from God, who have a hunger for God, who are wanting to know who God is, it's up to us to explain that. And so God is at work on Cornelius' heart, and God is also at work simultaneously on, on Peter's heart. So what is going on with Cornelius? Verses 5 through 8, I read verse 5. Let me read it again. Now send men to Joppa, bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who had been one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened, and then he sent them to Joppa to go fetch, basically, Simon Peter, who is there. So what is happening here? Well, what's happening is God is drawing Cornelius and his entire household, and it's going to be all his friends too, to himself. And something tremendous is going to happen that we're going to cover next Sunday, but that, that's what's going on. It's explained in Hebrews 11, verse 6. Listen to what we are told in Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must know that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This is talking about us who know who he is, but it's also talking about people like Cornelius who don't. And God says, I, I want to reward those who earnestly seek me. If you respond to the amount of light that you have been given, I will give you more. And that's what's happening with Cornelius in this case. It happened with Cornelius, but it still happens today. And if you love to read, write down a couple books I'll recommend to you in this. One of them is Dreams and Visions, is Jesus Awakening the Muslim World. It's amazing to see what God is doing through dreams and visions, much like with Cornelius. And if you read this book, Dreams and Visions, God is Awakening the Muslim World, what you'll see is that never does someone have a dream of the gospel message. They, you know, uh, Jesus appears to somebody and says, now, I'm going to send you to the marketplace. Go look for a person wearing a red shirt. They'll explain it to you. And then they go to the market. They look for a person wearing a red shirt. And the person wearing a red shirt says, yes, I was sent here by Jesus. I guess I'm supposed to explain the gospel to you. That, that's what happens. You know, it's what happened with Cornelius and Peter. It happens today. You know, I, Colin, my son, was in Lebanon, Middle East. He's returning to the Middle East here in a few months as, as, as he engages once again in mission work. But he was speaking with a man in his 90s when he was there a few years ago in Beirut. And, and the man was talking to him, and Colin said, do you know Jesus? And the man smiled and said, yes, I, I know Jesus. Years ago, I was sick, almost dying. And I had a dream. And in my dream, 
I saw a room with 12 men at a table, and then there was a man in a white robe at the end of the table, and he held up a cup, and he said, take and drink and be healed. He said, I woke up and I was healed. I don't know why. So he sought out Christians who explained to him who this man was, and, and this man now in his 90s told Colin, he said these words, he says, my passport says I'm a Muslim, but in my heart I follow Jesus. God had rewarded his search for him as he earnestly sought him, showing him who he was. Or uh, there's a video, you can look it up today on, online, it's, it's uh, about a Maharaji, a guru of gurus in India, who has a dream, and in this dream, God says to this Maharaji, go to this particular temple, and I will, and I will explain to you who this man I'm showing you is, and, and he's showing him Jesus in a vision. And then he gets another vision of, uh, of a guy named Ravi, who he would come to know, and, and he gets this image of Ravi, uh, and he knows, I've got to travel six hours to this particular temple, and I've got to look for a guy named Ravi to explain to me who this person is that I saw in a vision. Well, God is also giving Ravi a vision. And so, uh, and so actually, camera crews are following Ravi as he goes to the parking lot of the temple and starts looking for a man he saw in his vision wearing orange robe with a turban and a, and a huge long beard. And so that's, that's kind of sticking out in a crowd. And so he's looking, he can't find him. Finally, he spots him. And he goes over to him and he says, God, let me know that I need to be talking to you. And the man had already seen his face. And so they go back into the temple, the Hindu temple, where they start talking. And Ravi, just an ordinary Christian man, leads this guru to Jesus. And this guru goes back and starts telling every one of his students now about about Jesus. And, and it so happens. You see, God is doing things like this. God will reward those who earnestly seek him. And another good book that you might read is, is Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. If you've not read that book about a, a, young, a young Muslim man who is desperately looking to draw closer to Allah, and in doing so, he meets Jesus face to face. So part two, so God will reward those who earnestly seek him. Well, the second question that we ask is this, is God a legalist? Understand this, God must deliver us from legalism and prejudice. So God is at work on Cornelius' heart, but now God has to be at work on Peter's heart because Peter can't preach the gospel to him while he's stuck in legalism. And he is stuck in legalism and he is stuck in prejudice. He won't even walk into a Gentile's house at this point. Not only that, but he's not about to eat what Gentiles eat. He'll consider himself unclean if he's around Gentiles. That's still where Peter is. And he's stuck in this legalism and in this prejudice. And God can't use him until he gets unstuck. So when you and I are legalistic, here's what happens. Even though Peter knew that he was saved by faith, he was still into legalism. When you and I are into legalism, thinking that uh, somehow we are right with God by our actions, three things are going to happen. We will start attributing our righteousness to our religious acts and not to Jesus' death on the cross. And I am now righteous because I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't go to movies. I, I worship on Saturday, not Sunday. I, I've been baptized in a particular word. Uh, you know, and, and now I am righteous because there are certain things that I do that you don't do. And that's, that's what legalism does. Or legalism st- does this. If we're legalistic, we start thinking that God owes us for what we have done. And so now, now our religious acts are, are basically our our wages. And God now needs to pay us for our wages. God, I went to church. You better, you better do this for me. You know? And, and that's, that's a legalism. Or thirdly, if we are legalistic, we will start looking down on others who don't do what we do. And we'll start drawing a circle and including those that do and excluding those that don't. And it just, it becomes a mess. Uh, that there was a pastor, I was listening to, to what he was saying uh, about 10, 10 or 15 years ago to one of his messages. And he was pastoring a church in Minnesota. And, and he woke up one morning and there was a huge snow. And usually they have snow plows to clear everything. Well, he lived on the other side of the lake from the church and the snow plows had not made it down his, down his roads. And so he was snowed in. 
And he knew he needed to make it to church. He was scheduled to preach. And so he looked across the lake and he saw his church way in the distance. And he decided to put on his ice skates and skate to church because after all, the lake was frozen. Now, this was a legalistic church where you didn't do anything on Sundays, including shopping or eating out or anything, any sports or anything like that. And so as he's skating to church, guess who's watching him skate up? It's the elders and the leaders and the deacons of the church. And so they're staring at him, and, and they're getting a bit upset. So he goes and he preaches that sermon. After the sermon, they sit him down and talk to him to ask him why he was ice skating on Sunday. And he said, well, I was snowed in. It's the only way I could get here. And, and they, that didn't help. Finally, it came down to a question. And their question was, did you enjoy ice skating on Sunday? And he said, no, I didn't enjoy it. And so because of that, they said, okay, it must be all right. I said, that, that's, that's legalism. Uh, and legalism is, okay, you're just supposed to be miserable on Sunday. Show up and listen to a miserable message and be miserable and sing miserable songs and, and go home and you have paid your dues because you have, been, you have successfully now been miserable on, on Sundays. I mean, it just, it just so happens that way. Well, Peter is stuck in that legalistic mindset as well. And so, and so here's what God does. The last verse of chapter 9 says this, Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Huh? If you're a Jew, you don't stay in the tanner's house. So God is breaking Peter out of his legalism. So tanner deals with dead animals. If you're a Jew, you don't, you don't hang around people who deal with dead animals. As a matter of fact, tanners were forbidden from, from many things in Jewish life. And, and even, even so much so, if you read the Mishnah and you go back to, to first century Jewish law, if you were betrothed to, a, to somebody who became a tanner, you could break off your betrothal because, because you, consider it, you could consider it a breach of contract if they chose to go into that line of work. I mean, that, that's how despised tanners were. And yet Peter is staying at the house of Simon the tanner. So jump with me to verse 9. It says, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. This is where he just has a vision. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And the voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Get up, kill, and eat. So basically, God shows him a menu and says, all this stuff that you didn't think was on the menu is now on the menu. Uh, get up and, and eat. Go ahead. Have at it, you know? And, and, and God is busting him out of his legalism. You see, in Leviticus 11, God had called many of these things unclean. He said, you're not supposed to eat them or you would be unclean. Uh, and you're not supposed to be around dead animals or you would be unclean. So what happened between Ele Leviticus 11 and Acts chapter 10? What happened is the cross of Jesus Christ. And Jesus died for our sins. And because of that, cleanliness now is not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. And we can now understand that there is nothing unclean in us because we are washed clean by his blood. And, and that's, that's the whole point. And what God is showing people in Leviticus 11 with all these dietary laws is, I want you to be holy and I want you to be clean. But then God shows us in the, in, at the cross that cleanliness is really a spiritual cleanliness. And we need to be spiritually clean. Uh, and and, and these, these examples of things that would defile our body are, are just examples, and we, sh we should be set apart for God and not defile our spiritual body because our body is a temple. I, I, don't wanna, I can preach a whole sermon on this, and I don't want to go down that road, but there are three main things the church is going to have to break out of. Three main legalisms and acts the church has to crack out of and break out of, and one of them is this dietary stuff. Because God is wanting them now to relate to non-Jewish people, and God is saying to Peter, Peter, this whole cleanliness thing, I have made you clean at the cross, now kill and eat, this is now on the menu. 
You can, you can do this. And God is showing Peter these things. It takes him a while to get it, but God is showing him these things. Dietary laws were one thing. The Sabbath was another thing. Jesus started healing on the Sabbath and doing things on the Sabbath, and, and, and he caught a lot of resistance from legalistic Jewish leaders because of what he did on the Sabbath. Now, the church, they never met on the Sabbath. Now, you've got people today that say that you're going to hell if you don't worship on Saturday because that's the Sabbath. Well, that is not true. Uh, the fact is, is the Bible says that the early church met on Sunday. That was the Lord's day because that's the day he rose from the dead. And it was a remembrance of the fact that he died to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and he rose again. And we gather on Sundays to celebrate, not to mourn. What well, we gather to celebrate that he is risen. And, and we gather to honor that. And that's why we meet on, on Sundays. And by the way, Hebrews 4 tells us that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Yes, it's good to take a Sabbath day rest, but don't get legalistic about it. It doesn't matter what day you take. Take some time off, but, but understand that our Sabbath rest is Jesus. He did the work for us. Now we rest eternally in him. And you see, what, what, was, what was intended physically, and they say, okay, this is a physical thing, God says, no, there's a spiritual meaning behind it. I want you to know the spiritual meaning behind the dietary laws. I want you to know the spiritual meaning behind the Sabbath. And then the third issue they have to crack out of is, is, is circumcision. And, and, and over the next few chapters in Acts, you've got, you've got this huge question is, okay, these people who aren't Jewish who come to Jesus, do they now need to be circumcised? And there's a whole lot of people saying, yes, they do. It's, it's Jesus plus circumcision equals salvation. And uh, they come back and they look at this and they say, no, that's a legalism as well. And Paul later goes on to talk about the circumcision of our hearts, where the deadness of our heart is cut away so that the, the Holy Spirit can fully inhabit who we are. And, and you see, these are spiritual meanings that the church then had to embrace and had to come to know. Go with me to verse 14. So, so <laughs> the sheet is lowered before, before Peter, and, and this is what Peter says as soon as God says, Peter, this stuff is on the menu. Peter says this, verse 14, Surely not, Lord, Peter replied, I have never eaten <laughs> anything impure or unclean. Surely not. So Peter looks back at Jesus and says, Nah, I'm not going to do it. You know, God, God appears to Cornelius, and Cornelius has reverent fear. But Peter's kind of like, no, no, I don't, I don't believe it. You know, I'm not going to... What is wrong with this? And what's wrong with it is that Peter is stuck in legalism and prejudice. And legalism and prejudice has taken over his mindset. When you and I are stuck in legalism and prejudice, we're no longer going to be in awe in God's presence. And we're no longer going to really enter into a time of worship because, because we're good. We're good just because we showed up. You know? We're good because we're doing all the right things. And, uh, and we're stuck in these things. And, and, and we're not like the people who don't do what we do. And that's where Peter is. And so he's lost his reverential awe of God. And, and, and so he, he just kind of says, he argues with God and says, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Verse 15 and 16 the voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure what God has made clean. This happened three times. Remember Peter, three times, he denied Jesus three times. Three times, three times Jesus says, do you love me? And now three times God has to, break, has to show him these things just to break him out of legalism. It happened three times. And immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. And th 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 this, is what, this is what's going on in Peter's mind. You know, I'm, he's, he's stuck in these things. You and I can get stuck in these patterns as well. Verses 17 and on. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was also known as Peter, was staying there. So you've got Cornelius' friends and, and soldiers who are going to fetch now 
Peter in Joppa, which is about 30 miles south of Caesarea. And so they make the trek, they go. So get up and go. so while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, verse 19, Simon, three men are here looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one that you were looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house that he could hear what you say. Then Peter invited the foreman into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. That's where I'm going to end today, but I want to talk about this for a little bit. You see, God is changing. He's converting Peter out of legalism. He's changing Peter's heart because he has to. And so he he reaches in, and he starts to convert him from legalism, so he does three things. And, And if you're taking notes on this passage, write down these three things that he does. He puts Peter in Simon the Tanner's house. You know, you and I, he gets us in a bar, you know. It could be that you're, you're saying, okay, Christians shouldn't drink. So God gets you in a bar, you know. And, and, and that's, that's kind of what happens with Peter, you know. And, and he, he busts out of this. God puts him in the tanner's house. Then God gives him a, ven- a vision of a new menu. And all these things are now on the menu. And now he's going to send him to a Gentile's house named Cornelius. And so there are three things that God does to bust Peter out of his legalism, out of his prejudice. And yes, he was both legalistic and prejudice. If you're a follower of Jesus, expect that he will put you in a place to also bust you out of legalism and to bust you out of prejudice because you will be ineffective for him until you do. So God will reward those who earnestly seek him. God must deliver us from legalism and prejudice. And thirdly, God wants all nations to know him. God wants all nations to know him. I want to show you something really cool that's happening in the book of Acts right now. In Genesis chapter 7, God floods the whole world. And he spares Noah and Noah's wife and Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. And they are all spared in the ark. And then once the flood is over, they emerge from the ark, and Shem, Ham, and Japheth go on to repopulate the whole world. You, You know the story? And, and their descendants, you've got the descendants. So everybody comes, the Bible says, from either Shem, the Semites, either Ham, the Hamites, or, the, or, or Japheth, the Japhethites. And probably most of us in this room are watching are probably descendants of Japheth. If you have a European background, if you have an African background, you're a descendant of Ham. If, uh, if you're Jewish in your background, you are a descendant of Shem. That's why we call it Semitism or anti-Semitism. It comes from Shem. All that, all that to say, guess what God's doing in his church? Acts chapter 8, who comes to Christ? It's a Hamite named the Ethiopian eunuch. And this Hamite comes to Jesus. Acts chapter 9, who comes to Jesus? It's a Semite named Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 10, who comes to Jesus? It's a Japhethite named Cornelius. What's God doing? I hope you can piece this together because it's so cool. God is saying, this is how I'm going to build my church. No one is favored. You know, n- no one is special. I love everyone. I am drawing everyone into my church. At its inception, the church is made up of all these differing ethnicities and nations. That, that was the whole point. That, that's why Pentecost happened at the day when everybody from all over the world was in Jerusalem because God is saying, this is what I want my church to look like. This is what I want your heart to be. I want you, if you are my follower, to have a missionary mindset and love people who aren't like you and bust out of your legalisms and prejudices so that you can because this is what I do in my church. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you that you grow us, you mold us, you shape us as individuals and as a church. Lord, some of us are asking some of these questions. What, what of those who have never heard thank you for the story of Cornelius? 
That th- thank you for even modern day stories like the story of Cornelius that we have heard. A- and Lord, you have entrusted to us, your followers, to the church, the message of the gospel. May, may we share that with all those that we know. May, may we not leave it up to the preachers of the church to do it. May we embrace our own individual calling. May you bust us out of, uh, of prejudice and legalism. And may we know that you love all people, that there is no favored race, there is no favored ethnicity. You love everybody. You want everybody to be in your family. This, this is the God that you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. So we continue to worship God by giving. There are five ways to give. Those are in your outline. And we, we continue to, 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 to connect with each other knowing that this is how we grow. And there are a variety of ways to connect and you can go online to find out how to do that. Would you stand and let me read these verses to you as you're dismissed? I, I want to read these verses as a benediction for you. These come out of Ephesians 2. 14 and 15. So just listen to these words. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of the law with its commandments and regulations, and he made peace between the Jews and the Gentiles in himself, creating one new people from the two groups. Go now as his people. In Jesus' name, amen.